When I was teaching art appreciation at our local college, sometimes the college would have elementary schools come on the campus for a tour. And one day the lady giving the tour came into my class and asked, uh, she said, Mr. Gomez, can these little, these, can these little students uh, come into your class for just a few minutes? And I said, no, go away. I don't want any kids in my, little kids in my class. And she said, but I'm in a, I'm in a bind and uh, there, there's a, this 15 minute gap from one thing to another and, and I don't have any place to take them. And so I said, okay, bring them in. So about 40 or 50 little kids piled into my class and when they were all settled in, I, I asked, I said, uh, kids, uh, how many of you love art? I mean, really love art. And they yelled out and they said, yes, they're, they're cheering for art. They said, yes, we love art. And I said, do you know, when new semesters begin, I often ask my students, how many of them love art? And do you know how many say yes? And they yelled out, all of them, all of them love art. And I said, zero, none of them love art. Every now and then there might be one or two, but they couldn't believe it. Uh, their, their mouths were open, they're shaking each other, and they're asking, what is wrong with your students that they don't love art? And so I, I said, something happens from the time students are little, like you, when parents are putting your art on the refrigerator. And when you fast forward to when they're in college, uh, most of them have lost their love for art. And so I encourage them to, to not lose that creative side, as I did with every, all the students every semester, to, to keep tapping into the way that they draw and sing and dance and play, because that creativity can help them for the rest of their lives. It can, it can help them solve problems and how they make decisions and how they, uh, but, but it has to be cultivated and nurtured because it's all in there like a reservoir that needs to be tapped into. And that's a picture of what can also happen spiritually. Followers of Christ can forget about the gifts that God has given them, this reservoir potential. They forget that they're unique and special Every person has their own spiritual fingerprint, but all of that potential and possibility can start to get clouded when we lose our eternal focus. Uh, we can lose our sense of wonder. Uh, it's easy to get distracted by the problems that we face and the cares of this world, and we forget why we were put here in the first place. And so today, we're going to see how we can redeem the time that we have. We're going to see how we can live with an attitude that pleases God and what it is that he's looking for in us. And so as we've been going verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark, we've come to chapter 9. Uh, Jesus, if you recall, was on the mount of, of what we call today the Mount of Transfiguration. Three of his disciples saw Jesus' glory shine through. And so they, they came down from that mountain and they, they met up with the other nine disciples. And, and we saw last time that Jesus cast out a, a, de a, a demon out of a boy. Uh, and now they're, they're about to travel south. Uh, they're headed down to their home base, their ministry home base, which was Peter's house. And so we pick it up here in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse uh, 33 uh, through 34. It says, and they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they, were, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. So now, because of what Peter, James, and John had seen on the mountain, the disciples' faith was sky high. I mean, they had... They had seen Moses and Elijah, two great men from the Old Testament, meet with Jesus on that mountain. God the Father spoke uh, to them from a cloud and affirmed that Jesus was his son. Uh, 
So these three disciples knew for sure that they had followed the right leader. They, they, they must have affirmed that to the other nine disciples, that Jesus is the one. Uh, if they did not have enough proof already with all the miracles that he'd done uh, that Jesus was the Messiah, there was, there was now no doubt. Right? But right after this experience on the mountain, Jesus started talking about suffering and dying. Jesus was preparing them for his coming crucifixion, but they did not understand what he was talking about. And instead of discussing this topic of suffering, which he had given to them, they were instead arguing about who is the greatest. You know, back in the 1960s boxing, boxings, Muhammad Ali talked about being the greatest. And Ali won the gold medal in boxing in the 1960 Olympics. He became world heavyweight champion at the age of 22. He was flamboyant and brash, but he backed, it, he backed up his talk. And in 1999, as the millennium was coming to a close, uh, Sports Illustrated named Ali the sportsman of the century. Turned out they named him the greatest. And we seem to be fascinated with this same idea. Uh, the, the, what, are, what are the, at, at the end of every year, what are the funniest clips? What are, who are the most influential people? It's not enough to just to appreciate uh, these people in these moments for, for what they are. No, we have to have a rundown. We have to have a top 10. We need to see who's number one. And it's one thing for an athlete or an entertainer to say that they are the greatest. But it's another thing for Jesus' followers to do this. And this is not to say that we can't have confidence. But our confidence is not in ourselves as followers of Christ. Uh, maturity for us comes from having confidence in God. And yet here are Jesus' disciples arguing about who is the greatest among them. And Jesus doesn't seem to get angry with them, uh, but he does want to put a spotlight on their disagreement. And when he did, uh, they were embarrassed by it uh, to the point where they, when, when he asked them the question, they didn't even answer it was just like an awkward silence hanging in the air. And Jesus took this time to teach them uh, because he would not be with them much longer. And they, they needed this truth to sink into their hearts. But they were still not thinking the right way uh, because uh, they all still thought that Jesus was going to set up an earthly kingdom. Uh, they were jockeying for position because uh, once people found out that Jesus was the Messiah, they were going to want him to crown him king. And he, he would, they thought that he would free them from the Roman oppressors. And the 12 disciples figured that they would be a part of Jesus' ruling cabinet. In fact, a great example of this is in Matthew 20. That, this was the time when the mother of, of James and John came to Jesus on behalf of her sons. And she was like a helicopter mom, right? She was, she was hovering over her kids a bit too much. And in Matthew 20, she asked Jesus, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in the places of honor uh, next to you, one to the right and the other to, the, to your left. And Jesus told her like, you don't know what you're asking about. And he started talking about suffering again. And the disciples were not upset that James and John's mom had the audacity to ask such a question. No, no, no. They were upset because they didn't have the idea first. She beat them to the punch of asking. And in Matthew 20, uh, 26, Jesus told them, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Because again, Jesus wasn't there to build an earthly kingdom. Jesus came to build an eternal kingdom that is still here today and will continue forevermore. The characteristics of someone who is a part of God's kingdom is different from this world. We have to be empty in order for God to fill us. The citizens of God's kingdom have to get past themselves their own selfishness and self-centeredness to mature 
to become what we were meant to be, we have to get past our own pride. Uh, in the early 1900s, there was an author of popular Western adventure novels named Zane Gray. Uh, one of the stories Mr. Zane told, uh, wrote about was of a Native American tribe that was being attacked by their enemy. Their wise chief instructed his tribe to pack all of their belongings and leave camp at night in the dark. And as they were making their way, the tribe was stopped by a creek that was overflowing from the melting snow. So the chief instructed the youngest, the, the youngest, strongest braves to each carry one person on their back and to take them to take uh, one person to the other side. And in the darkness, some of the braves only looked out for themselves. They went into the rushing water without helping anyone. And the strong current of the swollen river swept these young men along. And the other braves, the ones who carried a child or who carried an elderly person, they did not get swept away. Because they, because they had more weight on them, their legs sunk into the creek bottom with every step. These braves made it safely to the other side because they were willing to help others, not realizing that in helping others, they were also helping themselves. And that's a picture of what life can look like for us, helping others get to the other side can help to keep us from becoming self-consumed. And that, that, that's what got the devil in trouble in the very beginning. Uh, the, the devil, uh, Satan, he, he, was, he was not always so evil. Uh, no, the devil started out as an angel in heaven named Lucifer. He was the worship leader in heaven. He was beautiful and gifted. And then he started to get a little too full of himself. Uh, he, in Isaiah 14, describes Lucifer's downfall. I'll read a little section of that. But notice how many times he says, Lucifer says, I, I, I. It says, uh, for, for, for you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heaven and be like the most high. So all the devil could talk about was himself. And because Lucifer wanted to lift himself up, God knocked him down. Lucifer wanted to be at the top, and God put him at the bottom. And it's no wonder that this world that we live in is so ruthless. Uh, this is where Lucifer was cast down to. And Jesus called this same devil the ruler of this world for now. And God is still sovereign, but this is the devil's domain. And that's why Satan's uh, viewpoint saturates our culture. He deceives people with lies. It's no wonder that we live in a doggy dog world and uh, it wants to squeeze us into its selfish mold. Everyone wants to get what they can and get what and can what they get. But God's kingdom is opposite. The citizens of God's realm, the followers of Christ, we are supposed to be different from culture. We are salt. We are preserving agents of righteousness in a world of decay. And we live, we are called to live according to kingdom values. And we are in the world, but not of it. And in God's kingdom, to go up, we must go down. To receive, we must give. To be first, we must be last. It's good to have drive and ambition. But Jesus is saying that we do, it by, we do that by serving others, by helping others get to the other side. Before Jesus was uh, arrested on, on his final night with his disciples, uh, Jesus, uh, you know, they, they were all wearing, they were all together, uh, and everybody wore sandals back then. People's feet would get very dirty. It was uh, dusty streets, uh, manure everywhere. Uh, and they did not sit at tables like we do today here in the West. No, back then they would, they would recline on the floor to eat. And you'd like, on your elbow, and then with the other hand, 
eat. So someone's, if someone's uh, dirty, smelly feet was next to you, you could tell. And if you were at someone's house, they would usually have a servant who would wash everyone's feet when they walked in. And if the, there was no servant available to perform this menial task, it was customary for someone in the group to volunteer to wash everyone's feet. So on Jesus' final night with his disciples, before he was to be arrested, they shared their last supper together. That, that's, what, that's why they were there. But no one wanted to, to uh, wash anybody's feet. And certainly not if, if they were jockeying. They were still jockeying for position that night. And so Jesus took this opportunity to again set an example for his disciples. He, he grabbed a towel and a basin of water. And the master, the son of God, stooped down to wash the smelly, dirty feet of his followers. And even the feet of the betrayer who was still there, Judas. Jesus was placing an exclamation point on this idea of servanthood. He, he was still trying to retrain their brain from an inward selfish focus to an outward selfless focus, showing them what it's like when we place others before ourselves. He was reteaching them, reshaping their mindset. And Mark 39, uh, 9, Mark 9, 35 uh, said that Jesus sat down for this, <laughs> uh, going back to what, where we started. Uh, and, and he took the time to explain to them uh, these things about the kingdom of God. So he did not skim over this lesson. And this was very important. And again, they were at Peter's house, uh, more, than like, uh, they were more than likely, and he was married. And, and there was probably lots of kids running around. And look at what Jesus did here in Mark 9, verse 36 and 37. It says, And he, Jesus, took a child, put him in, in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. When I was in college, uh, I served as a summer missionary to San Francisco. And I noticed on the calendar that there were several weeks that summer where they had a schedule to work with kids, lots of kids. And now at the time, I was not comfortable teaching uh, children. I had no experience with them. And as I looked at that summer calendar, they had us uh, doing multiple backyard Bible clubs and vacation Bible schools. In the mornings, we'd work with little children. And then in the evenings, we'd work with students, with the older students, the youth. I, I was dreading the whole thing. But I want you to know that those weeks turned out to be some of the best highlights of the entire summer. Uh, the more I was around kids, I was reminded of how they are so full of life. Uh, they, they have so much enthusiasm. Their hearts are so pure and, and they're, they're open and honest. Kids have a a uh, sense of wonder and, and curiosity. And I, I went to teach them. And in the process, they, they ended up teaching me. And notice that Jesus did not, at this point, use the religious leaders as his example of what the kingdom of God looks like. He did not sit the, a Pharisee or a Sadducee in the middle as the model to follow. He did not call a Roman soldier to show as an example of what a real warrior in God's kingdom looks like. No. Jesus called a little child. And this might, might have been like a little toddler running around because he was small enough to just scoop him up and, and hold him, and hug him. And Jesus held him in his arms and he said that these are the ones we are to emulate. And now we all know that kids can be immature, right? They, they can throw their temper tantrums. But Jesus isn't saying that we should be childish. He is saying that we should be childlike. Little kids need their parents for everything, especially when they're really small. None of us would have lived very long without someone 
to care for us. We need someone to nurture us and to help us physically. And the same is true spiritually. We need to have that childlike quality. Ch children trust so easily. Uh, watch them play on the playground and, and they, they make friends so quickly. And if one hits the other and they start crying and you think, oh, they'll never talk again, very soon they forgive each other and they're playing again. Those are the kind of characteristics, the qualities that Jesus is talking about here, where we look to God for everything. If God says it, we believe it. Where we're full of love, where we're free, where there's a purity of heart, where we are vulnerable. And, and these are the things that we had in us when we were little. And somewhere along the way, we got away from them. The older people get, they, get they, they tend to become more jaded at times. We, are, we become suspicious, even of God. We want to control everything. We don't want to have to fill in any blanks with, that, with faith. We, we want all of our questions answered before we make a move. Uh, we think that as Christians, we, we need to all act grown up. But Jesus is saying that the grown-ups need to act more like children. Did you get that? You hear what I'm saying? That we think that as Christians, we need to act all grown-up. But Jesus is saying that the grown-ups need to act more like children. Imagine what your life would be like with no fear. We can feel fear, but don't let it stop you. Imagine the best version of yourself today. Not filled with regrets from yesterday. Not filled with fears for tomorrow. Free to be the person that God created you to be. You know, the other day, uh, we were at, with our two grandkids at, the, at their school carnival. It was a cool evening and uh, it was growing colder by the hour. Uh, our older grandson is named Ethan and uh, he, he's 11. He, he's, he's quiet and reserved, very calm. Ethan has a deep sense of empathy. And th this all came out that night. He, he, he did not really want to write anything or play any games. And so we watched his little brother, Andrew. You know, he rode the ponies. He petted the animals. He played the games. You name it, Andrew wanted to do it. But Ethan, no. He, he, he was going along calm, uh, cool, quiet. And then the very last game was a dunking boot. And all of a sudden, uh, Ethan wanted to do it. And he said, Grandpa, I, I, want, this is, I want to do the, this dunking boot. And so I gave him three tickets. And he started walking toward the dunking boot. And for those in other parts of the world listening who have never seen one of these dunking boots, they're big, giant tanks full of water. And a person sits suspended over the tank uh, and, on a plank. And that plank that they're sitting on is connected to a target that you can throw balls at. And when you hit the target, the plank swings down and the person suspended over the water falls into the pool of water. Well, as Ethan is walking up to the dunking area, he saw the guy on the plank shivering and he's all wet and the night is getting colder. And so Ethan had so much empathy for this guy that he, he turned around and came back to where we were, and he said, uh, I'm not going to do it after all. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, the guy in the booth is, is too cold. And if I knock him into the water, he's going to be even colder, and, and I just can't do that to him. And I said, and I replied, <laughs> Ethan, the guy is asking for it. He wouldn't be up there if he didn't want to get dunked. And he said, nope, I'm not going to do it. And so he gave me back the tickets. So I'm standing there with them like this. And that's when his seven-year-old little brother said, I'll do it. <laughs> he, he grabbed the tickets. And he went to turn them in. And the guy gave him three balls. And Andrew missed all three, all three shots. And, but then the guy taking the tickets told Andrew that if he wanted to, he could walk up to the target and just push it with his hands. And 
oh, Andrew wanted to. <laughs> so he ran up and he smashed the target with his hands and the guy goes flailing into the water. Andrew walked over to the guy in the tank and gave him a wet high five. Uh, kids doing what they do, being who they are, each one different and unique, each one special in God's eyes. Neither reaction is right or wrong, but both reacted the way they were made to react, and that's okay. As adults, it's our job to help them take that energy, that outlook, that perspective, and to point them in the right direction. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Uh, in the way that he should go, that little phrase means according to their bent. God has placed inside of every child a certain bent, certain inclination, certain propensities. Every child has uh, passion and compassion. And as adults around them, we watch for these proclivities and we help guide them and nudge them in that direction. And that is how we are all built. We were all once children. We might not have had a, adults around us who did much nurturing or guiding. Maybe they, they were too busy with their own issues to pay any much attention. But that does not change the fact that we're all, we are all custom made by God. Maybe, maybe it's taken a long time for some of us to figure out what we're gifted in. But it's all still there. And it can be nurtured. We can look to our Heavenly Father for help. Uh, we can ask Him for wisdom about what we should do with these things that He's placed inside of us. And He'll give us the wisdom. Because our story isn't over. And what is before us is better than what's behind. And this attitude that children have is a big key for us in understanding this and in becoming who we were made, meant to be. Simple trust. Simple faith. And be curious. Let your heart fill with delight. Uh, there's no need to compare yourself to someone else. You are unique. Uh, don't be childish, but be childlike in your faith. Uh, think, think about that. The mightiest warriors in God's army are like children. They're weak, but he's strong. They're small. God is big. And we understand that we need him more than anything else or anyone else. Uh, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. And again, let me read Mark 9, 37, because it is so profound what Jesus said. He said, anyone who welcomes a little child like this, on my behalf, welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me, welcomes not only me, but also my father, who sent me. We think that people out on the mission field are the most important people in God's kingdom. We might think that the most important people are the ones who are preaching or teaching or leading worship. And those are all important things. But Jesus is saying that the bottom is the top and the top is the bottom. And when we welcome little children, we welcome Jesus. When we welcome little children, we welcome God the Father. We usher in the kingdom of heaven on earth. And so let's not overlook these little ones in our midst. Watch how they look at life and learn from their perspective. And Jesus set the example for us. Jesus was in heaven and he was with God. And he came all the way down and was born as a baby in a manger. Mary and Joseph had care for the Son of God. They raised him up as a boy in their home, and then he suffered and died in our place. And Jesus did all of that so that we could be raised from death to life. And Jesus did all of that so that we could become a part of God's family and become sons and daughters of God. If you don't know where you stand in your relationship with God, you can be sure right now. 
confess your sin. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God and trust him as the Lord of your life. Let's go to God together in prayer. Father, thank you for your grace and your love. Thank you for giving us promises that we can hold on to. We believe in you and we believe your words. And the more we come to know you, the more we love you. Help us to get back to the basics, to love you with a whole heart. We might not always understand. The timing might not always be what we expect. The result might not be what we had in mind, but we trust that your way is best. And we know that one day when we get to heaven, we'll see things clearly. I pray for those who are feeling despair today. Help them to find your hope. For those who feel weak, give them strength. And for those who are down, lift them up as only you can. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And to you be all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.